this is a weird day, you know? We have this um, emergency conference that, <laughs> that we spent the last couple months putting together. And um, piece of advice, don't offer to speak at a conference that you're also organizing. <laughs> T-I-L. Um, but here we are, that's cool. Um, hmm. Tom, you made me cry. This is a really important conference to a lot of us, and um, we have a lot of feels, so I feel like that's on. I feel like I'm hearing echo. No, nope, it's not. Okay. Um, so I, I'm, my job is to talk about empathy, which uh, kind of makes sense, given how we got here. And um, I want to make sure I talk about the real stuff, so I'm... I always make these slide decks, you know, and I make these well-organized talks that seem like a really good idea at the time. But um, <laughs> I'm just going to talk about what it feels like needs talking about uh, and follow along with the slides. So let me tell you what kind of asshole I am. <laughs> so my kid is here, and that's never happened before, so that's kind of weird. But... Um, <laughs> One day I was wearing a t-shirt that said something like, be the change you wish to see in the world. And bless his heart, he says, um, you should maybe try that sometime. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have parents, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure I've made his life difficult at times, right? Um, so... If anybody ever tells you that I'm not an asshole, you can remember that. So I'm going to talk about, we have these fuzzy words like empathy, right? There are people across town who would tell you that they're very empathetic, and yet we might not mean the same thing. So I'm going to talk about what I mean by empathy. Um, I mean when you meet another person, and whatever weird stuff they're doing, whatever strategies they have, you recognize in them that you have a shared experience. You're both human, you both have needs and desires, and you can understand those in each other. You can see the other person and understand that they have the same sorts of human needs that you have. And you can see in what's going on some kind of experience that you can mirror and recognize. I really want to cough, and I can't remember where the mute button is. Much better. So I distinguish empathy from sympathy sort of like this. Um, if, I, if I would go to my mom with some bad news, my mom specifically, the response I would get is, um, oh, that's horrible. You lost your job. This is terrible. Right? Like suddenly it's her problem and I'm taking care of her. No, mom, it's okay, really. That's sympathy. It's sort of generating a bunch of feelings in response to the other person's feelings. But when I talk about empathy, I'm talking about a, a sort of grounded willingness to see things from the other perspective without taking it on, without losing who I am at the same time. I said that last, last slide, so I'll move on. <laughs> so... Um, why do we talk about this stuff? You know, it sounds really nice. You can put it on a Hallmark card or whatever. But when shit goes down, then it gets really hard, right? It gets scary and difficult. And that's when empathy is interesting. That's when there's something to talk about. Um, if I'm in a conflict with someone and they come to me with like, ideas and, and stuff, and I want to empathize with them. It's easy if it's not about me. If it is about me, then it gets hard, right? If they are holding theories about me that, you know, I'm a bad person or I've done something horrible, that's when it becomes really difficult. So empathy is, is the stance that I choose to allow me to interact with other people the way I want to, right? I set up my thing so it doesn't show me the next slide. So I'm like, I'm, I have no idea where we're going with this either. <laughs> so when I come into a conflict, I get to choose. 
I can dig in and I can protect myself, or I can open up and empathize. And I will tell you that I choose both of those things at different times. I mean, each of those things at different times. Um, and self-protection is very legit. But if I do self-protection mindlessly, what I'm doing is I'm sort of not subjecting my ideas to criticism and I'm not open. I'm instead building a wall between me and the other person, which can be a really good idea. There are people that I build a wall between me and them and I don't engage, right? This is a very selfish thing. A lot of people think when I'm talking about empathy that I'm talking about some sort of moral imperative, and I am not, because you don't owe anybody your empathy. That's my opinion. You get to decide who you owe what, but I don't owe anybody my empathy. My empathy comes because it makes my life easier. It makes me be able to be who I want to be in the world. It makes me be able to show up and listen when I want to be able to show up and listen, but I don't owe it to anybody. I didn't. I didn't just say empathy comes naturally. But I probably was going to, or I did last time I talked about this. I talked about this as OS feels, and I thought I would just use the same talk. But this feels like a different circumstance. Um, you guys know about OS feels? It's an open source and feelings, and it's in Seattle. It's an awesome conference. You should totally go. Anyway. Um, but if I had said empathy comes naturally, then now I would say sometimes. Sometimes it comes naturally, right? Humans have the ability to empathize right from the start. You can watch two-year-olds display that ability. And then we grow up, and we get threatened by things, and we get triggered by stuff, and we get abused by people, and we end up building up a way to avoid empathizing because it's easier in, in the moment. But if we can break that down, then we can connect with other people, and we don't, we don't have those walls. Because I think we want connection, right? Human beings want connection with other people. And then we also don't want to be rejected or hurt, and so we have to be very careful when we connect. That I did just say. <laughs> so if you want to be able to empathize when it's really, really hard, when somebody's in your face or somebody's being uh, um, angry or difficult or presenting some theory that is painful to listen to. How do you do that? What happens inside you that lets you make the choice to listen if you want to? Yeah, these are really weird. <laughs> Whoops. Has that ever happened to you? <laughs> it happens like all the time, and it happens really often with dreams specifically. I've gotten to now I just crack up laughing when this conversation starts. Is that true, Tracy? <laughs> um, it, but it happens. If you think about this after you leave here, you'll see it happen constantly. Just little tiny things, right? Somebody's like, Oh man, that talk really moved me. Really, I like this other one. Just like that. Just like this butting heads constantly. And it's, it's really amazing. You can watch the disconnect happen. People want to be connected. They come up and they're like, connect with me. Hear me tell you how I felt about this thing. And the response is, the wall goes up. Right? It's everybody for themselves. So. The option is to say, I just noticed my own dream coming up. I wonder if I can turn my attention there or not. Can I set it aside? Can I say, well, tell me more about your dream? Or am I in a place where I can't set it aside? Like, I know that I can say to even people who know this pattern really well with me, I can say, OK, so the thing happened. I heard you say that, and it reminded me of a nightmare. And now I'm really freaking out. I don't think I can listen. And then we just choose like, what the situation is, how we're going to listen to each other. And um, the reason I bring that up is because in any tiny little moment, empathy only works one way. It's great when it's two-way back and forth. But in that instant, when somebody's 
pouring their heart out to you. You get to receive it or push it away. There's not really another choice. If you come back with your own shit, you're not receiving it and the connection's not gonna happen. Does that make sense? Did I say that right? Okay. So if I wanna be empathetic and I've got somebody, um, okay, here's an example. Um, and here's how you know I'm diverging from the talk I gave at OS Fields. So say I um, encounter Curtis Yarvin. And, um, and it's just us. There's nobody here. There's nobody here who's black. There's nobody here who I feel like I need to take care of. There's just me and there's Curtis Yarvin. And he tells me a theory he has. And my first thought is, Boom! Right? That's, and I, you know, I'm, never, I'm not going to lie to you. That is my first thought. Anybody who wants me to be somebody who doesn't have that first thought is barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> um, so how do I meet that? Right? And, and again, I'm saying I'm me. I'm coming from a place of privilege when I meet Curtis Jarvin. Right? It's not me. Okay, never mind that. I happen to be in a place where I can hear him and not take it on. That is... Uh, fortunate for me, right? It has to do with how much abuse I've suffered, uh, how I interact with cops in the real world on a day-to-day -day basis, um, my wealth, my privilege, all of that stuff, right? So I happen to be a person who can receive him, and I say, I hear you telling me this idea, and then I give him a really honest answer. That's not polluted by me punching him in the face. So my honest answer is like, when I hear that theory you just said, I feel all this stress in my body and I really have a hard time listening. But I wanna try to work with you, so can we do that? Maybe he chooses to meet me, maybe he doesn't. Because even he gets consent, right? He gets to decide whether he wants to have this conversation or not. So if we have the conversation, then I'm starting to look for what's going on inside him. What human traits that I can understand is he exhibiting and is he trying to, what needs is he trying to meet, right? He, he takes all his time to write these treatises about these ideas he has. What need is he meeting that I can understand? It could get really complicated. We have needs like the need for acceptance and the need for love and connection. We need food. We need um, self-image, right? Self-love. We have all these needs and we have really bizarre strategies for meeting them. Just bizarre, right? We want to feel strong and powerful so we beat somebody up who's really little. That's a strategy. It's probably not a very good strategy and it's kind of stupid, but we do it. We have all kinds of strategies for meeting needs that don't work. Um, I don't expect we'd get very far, Curtis Yarvin and me. Um, and in fact, I've pretty much given up on my own mother. So I'm not saying that I can always get, maybe I could if I sat there for six years or something, but my energy is limited, so I choose where I want to invest it. But it's not an untackable problem. And if I am triggered, and I brought up my mother, I choose not to engage. Often is not. That's somewhere I choose not to go. Because you know what? It's my body, it's my mind, it's my empathy. I get to choose. Hmm. Oh, yeah, I remember this. <laughs> well, I mean, did, would you really want to hear a used talk instead of hearing about Curtis Yarvin? <laughs> um, so if I'm telling myself a story, that um, he's a bad guy, or the organizers of the other conference are bad guys, or whatever. That interrupts my ability to listen to where they're at, right? And, and when I'm trying to empathize, I wanna get underneath that. But the other thing is, I know that they're also telling themselves a story. There are a lot of people who have stories about me, right? There are. Plenty of people who think, um, well, I won't specify what the stories are. There are lots of people who have stories about me that I do not like. 
And if I want to be able to do hardcore empathy when the time comes, what I have to do with those stories is not give a shit. It's not my problem. I do, I approach a person, I look for consent, interest in engaging with them, and then I engage. If they're not interested in engaging with me, done. It's like, I don't have to worry about it. If they're interested in engaging with me in a way that I don't like, like yelling at me or telling me I'm shit, I also don't have to do that. I don't get to control the story they're telling about me, but I also don't worry about it very much. Oh, see, I said that. <laughs> oh, this is my favorite slide, so I'm going to pay attention to it. Do you remember a blog post, a third in a series that was full of diagrams? Anybody? <laughs> Hypothetically, there was a conference across town, right? And the people were talking about how they made their decisions about speakers. So if I, let's say Curtis is right. Let's say that there's a part of the population who is less intelligent than the rest of the population. It's really hard to do. I don't even want to give this example, but I'm just going to deal with it. Um, and that may make some people have ideas about me that I don't like. Um, but let's say he's right. Somebody's standing right in front of you and they're hurting, right? And you have a theory about their hurting. Do you suppose they want to hear it? That's where the title of this talk came from. Well, actually. If you listen to other people for connection, you'll hear when they have pain in their voice, right? Or when they're having emotions. And if you don't want to be the kind of person functional programmers have a reputation for being, you will not reply with, well, actually, right? So that's what you have to decide. Who do I want to be in that moment? How do I want to respond? When somebody's coming at me with strong feelings, do I want to meet them and listen, or do I want to correct them Nobody gives a shit how right you are. If somebody comes to you and they're like, women make 78 cents on the dollar and it's really awful. You know, even if you, you know, you may be a progressive and you may want to say, well, actually women of color make 32 cents on the dollar. You're still not meeting them where they're at, right? Or you might say, actually that's been discredited and since 1986, you know, this is bullshit because they're not accounting for these factors. Really? What if you say, how does that affect you? What's that, what's that like for you in your life? It's just an idea. You don't have to correct every idea you run across. You can just meet the person where they're at, and then maybe when the two of you are connected, you could explore the ideas together. Somebody I'm connected to, I can say, you know, I heard that 78 cents of the dollar thing, and I actually have questions about it. Then it's an interesting conversation. It's not shutting them down and telling them not to feel things. I have no idea what the rest of the slides say, honest. <laughs> that is true. This is probably useful, though. When I'm certain, especially when I'm certain that I'm right, I suck. I like, I'm just um, arrogant and obnoxious and often angry, and I don't understand why people are such idiots, and I can't get connection. And then I get lonely. Do you ever have a fight with somebody that you care about that just doesn't make any sense. And it just keeps getting worse. And in your head, you're like, this doesn't make any sense. And you, so you try to say it. You're like, wait, I don't think we're really fighting about anything. And then they scream back at you. Yes, we are. How can you even say that? <laughs> and then two minutes later, you're yelling back. And like suddenly, you are mad again. And you're like, I'm so confused. This is one way you can put a stop to that in the moment. Anytime somebody pisses you off. You reach for that little spot in your brain, you flip the switch, and you start wondering what's going on. And it requires that you, all of this stuff, you know, we do these meditation things and stuff. It's because all of this stuff requires you to get friendly with yourself, to get to know yourself, spend time with yourself. If you want to get to where you can flip the switch and become curious, you've got to be really grounded and not like scared or 
You don't have to know how, not, I don't want to say don't be scared because I'm scared most of the time. But um, for instance, developing a practice of breathing. I have in my life developed a habit so that most of the time when I get stressed out in the moment, um, somebody walks up and decides to judge me or whatever, my reaction is to go. And I'm pretty sure that my body actually reacts to having more oxygen. But I'm not going to try to do any science thing because that's not my shtick. Other people do that. Brene Brown does that. She's got research. I don't have any research. But I did find out that when I can meet those moments with a breath or two breaths, I am stronger and more able to show up as who I want to be. All of this empathy stuff is about showing up as who I want to be. I'm not happy with who I am when I can't, when I can't be empathetic. Um, interestingly, I used to do this martyr thing with my mom. I shouldn't be talking about my mom. This is live streamed. Oh, well. <laughs> I mean, I love her, and uh, I guess I won't say anything I wouldn't want her to hear. Um, I used to do this, this martyr thing, right? I'm going to get myself all psyched up before I go visit. I'm just going to totally meet her with compassion the whole time. And at some point, I said, this is not fun. <laughs> This is, not, this is not helping me be who I want to be in the world, you know? And since I stopped doing that, I am much better able to do this. I'm not curled up in a ball, sobbing, <laughs> etc. So, I mean, I, who I want to be in the world is a very complicated thing, but I do know that I want the ability to empathize when the time comes. I want to have that option. What the heck is that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's easier big. It's hard to see on the, yeah. Well, I guess that's pretty obvious what that is, isn't it? <laughs> that's my brain, apparently. Yeah, so that. <laughs> see, I just said all that about my mom, and then there's a slide. It goes right with it. It's almost like they match up. <laughs> I have seven minutes, so let me see what I get to. Oh, yeah, this is uh, concrete stuff. If you want to empathize with somebody who's being really weird, this is one way you can do it. You go, um, somebody cuts you off in traffic. Right? They're an inconsiderate asshole. And you're just like, what an asshole. So when I do that, I, I've, I've sort of put myself in a universe where other people are not understandable and they're mean and they're hateful. And that is a shitty universe to be in. I don't want to be there. Right? That's part of the reason why I want to empathize. That's a really big part of it. So you ever know somebody who walks around like blaming people all the time? Just like constantly pissed off about everything that happens? I think sometimes I'm like that. But so if somebody cuts me off in traffic, I don't want to be in that place. Where do I want to be? I want to be like, I'm surrounded by beautiful people, right? Which is how I am most of the time. Surrounded by people who are doing their best just like I am and we're all in this together. We're all connected. We're all one. I'll tell you what that means sometime, but... So when somebody cuts me off, I go, this person is, I, I could think of a million reasons why someone could cut me off besides they're an asshole. And really, in someone's own story, nobody's a villain, right? So they're in a big hurry, and they think they're going to get fired if they don't get to work on time. Or they're distracted because something horrible just happened to them, and they're crying right now. Or, and I can go on, and if I can come up with just three possible things, then suddenly they're starting to look like a human being. And I want to be surrounded by human beings, not villains. So this, I'll leave it as an exercise for the reader to do this with Curtis Yarvin if you should choose to. Oh yeah, this is the consent part. Okay, we're almost out of time, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about this real quick. 
So if you want to empathize with someone and they don't want to be empathized with, um, it feels to me like they can't stop you from empathizing because that's something that happens inside you. That's about who you are and how you spend your time and what you do with your own mind. But that doesn't mean they have to listen to you talk about how you're empathizing with them, right? Consent is really complicated, I guess. I didn't think it was until we put out the code of conduct for this conference. Should I assume everybody's read? Yes? No? Maybe? Um, but you don't really need somebody's consent to think about what they might be up to, right? Just to engage with them. Yeah, I don't know what I was going to say there. <laughs> I already covered that. I already covered that. Good, I think I'm done. Oh, I talked about empathizing with people I don't enjoy. I think I covered that. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So um, just to reiterate, when I talk about empathy and I talk about being compassionate in the world, it's not, um, I do think it makes the world nicer to be in and I like being around people who are doing that. But um, it's not a moral imperative from my perspective. I'm not asking you to do this for anybody but yourself, but I'm inviting you to do it for yourself. Uh, if you wanna have some peace and some connection in life. So that's what I got. I'm gonna stop here at 27 after. Um, I'll say if you have questions, catch me in the hallway. So I'll be here um, and take care of each other. <laughs>